Battle at the Farm. It was the first Warhammer 40,000 scenario ever published way back in 1987 as a sample adventure in Rogue Trader. And you might be thinking, wow, 1987, that's a long time. That's so old. This scenario is going to seem so quaint and old-fashioned. This is going to be a completely different game. Yeah, that's what I thought. But hold on. Hold on to that. It's not often we get to directly compare a scenario for Warhammer 40,000 between a modern rendition of it and literally the first edition of Warhammer 40,000. To celebrate the game's 35th year anniversary, Games Workshop recently republished the scenario, Battle at the Farm, for 10th edition Warhammer 40,000. So I thought it would be an interesting exercise to look at the original and look at the new iteration of it and just see what has changed. Addition aside, the story of Battle at the Farm is about a band of orcs against a squad of space marines. One player takes on the role of Captain Pedro Cantor, and the other takes the role of the orc warlord Throg Bullneck. The orcs have attacked planet Bad Landing, which is under the protection of the Crimson Fist chapter of Space Marines. Unfortunately, the orcs have managed to destroy, by accident incidentally, the Space Marine arsenal. So at the beginning of the scenario, the 16 Space Marine survivors are making their way to New Rin City. They've arrived at a burnt-out farm and are just settling in to get some much-needed rest when the orcs arrive. The orcs aren't there for the Space Marines, though. The orcs don't even know the Space Marines are there. They're looking for some jewels said to be hidden somewhere on the farm. That's the setup, and it's a strong one. I mean, it's one of the default ones in a war game. Both sides arrive on the battlefield, each with an opposing objective, and they fight one another uh, so that they can do what they want to do. This deftly demonstrates, I think, to new players, that a war game is more than just player removal. There's a story happening before the combat, and a story happening after the combat, and most importantly, there's a story during the combat. It's not just about killing all of the other miniatures on the table. There's other stuff to think about. I kind of admire that from the first edition of the game. I mean, Warhammer wasn't the first war game ever, so it had it, it obviously had a lot to learn from, but it's just kind of cool that even in their first edition of, of 40k, they knew to make the scenario about more than just put your miniatures on the table and shoot at each other. I will, for clarity, be using the terms first edition for Rogue Trader and 10th edition for modern, as of this recording, the current version of Warhammer 40,000. Games Master. In the first edition, the Games Master is provided with basically no guidance about the role of, of a GM. I assume the author took it for granted that the reader would just understand what a GM was and would figure out how a GM integrates into gameplay. But as written, it seems the Games Master, to me, is just the person throwing the party and the person who is tasked with physically setting up the game table. There's literally a paragraph in the original rulebook that just tells the GM to arrange a time and place for the game and to set up the game table with terrain. In the 10th edition, it's encouraged to play with a games master despite there being no role for a GM defined in the 10th edition of Warhammer 40,000 rulebook. It recognizes this um, disparity though and addresses it pretty much right away with this admonition. This battle can be played without a GM, but we thoroughly recommend it. It's great fun. In the Games Master's Packet, which is a separate PDF, a separate download, it defines the role further. What is a Games Master? As the Games Master, it's your role to keep the game running and fun for both players. You're an unbiased party, there to create the story of the game, call out rules and dice rolls needed, and to give players options and hints at the overarching story. That's very helpful, and I, can, I, I can't help but think that the exact same paragraph would have been a great addition to the first edition. It goes on to encourage the Games Master to take initiative over the story. This is a narrative game, so make up new events, incidents, and conditions to help the game along and make it more exciting. 
Later in the document, there are random tables full of ideas for complications, environmental effects, including the reveal of a nesting wild grox for the Games Master to play. Specifically, the Games Master rolls 2d6 at the start of every battle round and references the battle round events table. Uh, I say that, actually there's accidentally two battle round events table in the PDF. One, they're, they're both labeled battle round events, but actually one, the first one, is a random table that you roll on when an orc searches for jewels. The second one is the actual battle round events table. Anyway, obviously the 10th edition version of Battle at the Farm was designed by people who recognize that a game is a collection of imperatives. There's an algorithm in this version of the scenario. When this happens, you do that. I assume the first edition was trying to grant the Games Master total freedom, and to convey that freedom it just didn't provide the Games Master with any instruction at all, and on the surface that seems fine. But in practice, I think we've all come to learn, it only ensures that there's no baseline game experience. If you play the first edition version with an inexperienced Games Master, you might get anything from a table set up with terrain to a dominating storyteller who thinks you showed up for an experimental live theater performance. There's no fallback for a games master who doesn't know or doesn't care about how to run a fun game. The 10th edition version anticipates that and solves it with clear instructions that are fun for the games master and the players. It's a tabletop game, so obviously an experienced games master can deviate from the script. There's nothing holding that games master to only what is written in the PDF, but there's guidance in place for games masters who don't know what to do or who aren't comfortable in the role yet. And not insignificantly, that also serves as an escape hatch for players who end up with a games master who goes way off script. If your game is going well because the Games Master has taken a detour into performance art, you can politely cite a breach of contract, point to the PDF, ask them to adhere to the script, or else you'll take your miniatures and go home. I mean, don't say it like that, be nice. But there, there's just a little bit more of a formal expectation on both sides this way. Special rules. In the first edition version, each player gets a brief explanation about what they know about the scenario setup and what their objectives are. Included on those data sheets are unit and weapon stats. It's also really cute because there are little cardboard cutouts included for all of the figures in case you don't have any miniatures yet. It's great, it's brilliant, I love it. Uh, the objective for the orc player is to find hidden jewels hidden within one of the farm buildings. To do that, both Hruk and Thrug must be in the building uninterrupted for one full round. Then they found the jewels. The orc player knows exactly where the jewels are located because it's like written on the orc brief. The space marine player doesn't know that. The space player, space marine player doesn't know anything about the jewels at all. So this is an interesting secret agenda that may or may not matter in the end. I mean, if all orcs are slaughtered, whether Hruk and, and Thrug found some jewels is a moot point. But at the end, I mean, that those are victory points if you did find them and you're not dead. In the 10th edition version, there are several rules intentionally excluded, including chapter tactics and angels of death for space marines, here we go, and mob rule for orcs, and all stratagems, like literally all stratagems, except the one, the one stratagem defined in the scenario. Searching for jewels is very different in the 10th edition version, notably because the orc player doesn't know where the jewels are, and also it requires an intelligence test. I know, you're saying, but there is no intelligence stat in 10th edition. I realized that, and so did they, luckily. In the Game Master brief, the, the PDF for the Games Master, there's a table on how to figure out intelligence and classic stats like cool and willpower. So for intelligence, just out of interest, you subtract one from the highest leadership stat among your unit taking that test. Cool is the highest leadership minus two, and willpower is just the highest leadership. Uh, here's a side note about, about dice mechanics. This isn't the first scenario I've seen do it, but it is worth noting, I think. Normally, a die roll in Warhammer 40,000, in modern 40k, represents the success or failure of an action one of your soldiers is taking. But when you're searching for loot, the die roll actually represents the chance of loot existing in the spot your soldier is searching. You're not taking a test to determine whether 
the soldier was able to, I don't know, control a shovel or to find a hidden object because when you fail, it means there was no loot there in the first place. There's just nothing to be found. The die roll is representing something about the world, not the character. It's it's actually a major, I mean very subtle, but still major shift in game mechanics that's kind of easy to miss because it is kind of subtle and in the end it doesn't feel that different to you. It's either success or failure, but it does show the flexibility of the game, I think. You can let the game tell its own story by letting fate decide the state of the game world. Th that's just me musing about game mechanics. That's not really about Battle at the Farm, but I mean, it kind of is. Design. I, I guess the new version is prettier than the old one. It's not as severe as you might think, or at least I don't think it is. Um, one might suit your design sensibilities better than the other, but I didn't find that the design of either took anything away from what the written scenario was trying to communicate. Uh, here's some screenshots, or not screenshots, some scans, I guess, of the old one. And then here's the new one. I've seen old D&D &D modules that are pretty tough to decipher thanks to poor decisions made while cutting and pasting maps or tables into typewritten pages. It's usually something seemingly minor, like there being a table over on page 4, even though the rule that pertains to it is introduced way back to on, on page 1, or a map is just plain wrong. Basically, look at any version of Tomb of Horrors, which is a module I run annually and enjoy thoroughly, but also is a module that's made more confusing than necessary from poor layout and incorrect cartography. That's not the case for Battle at the Farm. Both versions are visually reasonable and perfectly usable. If you thought Warhammer 40,000 was just a war game, this humble little scenario proves that a war game can tell an exciting story through spontaneous interactions, manipulation of rules, and a solid framework. The two versions of the scenario are implemented differently, and I don't hesitate to say that the 10th edition version is a product of improved game design. Luckily, the way we document game rules has largely improved over the years, and I think this is a really great example of how explicit instructions can coexist with total player and GM freedom when written well and clearly. I would say it's much to my surprise that the 1st and the 10th edition of this scenario aren't really all that different. I mean, the 10th is 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 better. It has clearer instructions for the game's master. But everything else is kind of the same. Like, everything else is the same story, the same game. There are little adjustments here and there, some to account for the difference in game systems, others to just account to, to make something slightly better, like not knowing where the jewels are. But ultimately, it, it very much feels like basically the same scenario, which honestly I hadn't expected. I think if there's anything to learn here, it's that great ideas in a game rulebook produce great ideas in all participants around the table, and fully invested participation produces a great and memorable gaming experience. Thanks for watching!